Dr. Wardmar will be concluding the um, panelist expert perspective of today's conference, and then um, we'll follow that with the patient perspective and programmatic development. So Dr. Wire Jamora is um, an associate professor in health sciences and director of the Zuckerberg San Francisco General Hospital Neuropsychology Service and the director of the UCSF Neurocognitive Clinic. And uh, she, along with um, her colleague, Melissa Bree, who is a staff neuropsychologist and researcher uh, here at UCSF, will be discussing clinical applications of cognitive rehabilitation in adult brain tumor patients. Thank you, Dr. Wiregemore. Thank you so much. It's so wonderful to be here, and this has just been a really fantastic day. Thank you so much to the panelists for being able to spend time and the, and the audience for being able to be with us today. So again, my name is Christina Weyer-Jamora. I am a, a neuropsychologist, a rehabilitation neuropsychologist, and, um, and I work closely with patients and caregivers to help manage their cognitive challenges and learn ways to live well despite these changes. And so really the focus of my talk has much more to do with the, um, the clinical translational work that we've been doing, trying to take all those, that wonderful research that Karen had presented and, and really trying to enliven a clinical implementation of that work to, to move the needle on the morbidity of cognition as it uh, applies to our patients' lives. Today, we'll review clinical implementation of um, applying this evidence-informed uh, cognitive rehabilitation framework, as well as highlight our clinical trial efforts in this area to more systematically understand um, some of the things that we're seeing in our clinical practice. And of course, we always look forward to any questions and, and thoughts to help continue to refine our work and, and our thinking about this work. So in the outpatient setting, we're often supporting patients through tumor progressions and repeated tumor courses uh, and treatment courses. And after, as you previously heard from other speakers, we, it can have significant cognitive effects. Even during periods of relative stability, as previously noted, patients, patients can have cognitive concerns that impact their day-to-day -day functioning. Cognitive impairments are associated with lower rates of return to full-time work capacity, strained personal relationships, and reduced health-related quality of life. Um, and despite, despite the amazing progress that we've made in terms of being able to extend the, the lifespan of individuals with um, brain tumor, we unfortunately have so much work to do to continue to support them in their, um, in their cognitive health and support, and, and really this, this improved survival with the negative impact of cognition on their health-related quality of life really supports this idea of ap applying a chronic disease model to um, cognitive management. So as noted in this figure, cognitive rehabilitation really aims to reduce the gap between the functional demands that are placed upon the patient and their cognitive abilities. So the functional demands are this blue line and then the cognitive abilities are this green line. And uh, by applying neuropsychological interventions designed to improve cognitive abilities in the disease uh, period that the patient is in at that point um, and learn new ways to adapt and manage the world around them so they can be more functionally independent. So cognitive rehabilitation is considered a well-established treatment, um, as many have already talked about, to address cognitive impairments in many neurological diseases, extending back as early as World War II um, in, in diseases such as traumatic brain injury and multiple sclerosis and stroke. Um, and cognitive rehabilitation really is a systematic use of neuropsychological and other interventions and cognitive interventions designed to improve cognitive abilities and functional independence and, and promote the health-related quality of life for patients. It's based on um, principles, mechanistic principles of neuroplasticity and functional reorganization. And really two main types of interventions underlie this uh, in, use of, uh, in use of cognitive rehabilitation. So retraining and functional organization or, or functional compensation. So retraining strengthens impaired cognitive skills through repeatedly cog uh, practicing cognitive tasks, while functional compensation focuses on honing these strategies to modify the environment or how you go about achieving a goal. So these two interventional approaches are often combined, as, as Dr. Gehring had mentioned in the research studies and also in clinical practice. With, compensa with compensation or working around the difficulties or using your strengths, as we talk about with my patients, um, being particularly appropriate for treating more persistent cognitive um, difficulties. 
So when we think about translating principles of cognitive rehabilitation to clinical practice, we had to really put our thinking hats on in terms of how do we want to break this into something that's palatable and meaningful, also knowing that cognition is a team sport um, and, and being able to kind of pace patients through this, um, this very complicated and sometimes time intensive intervention. So we'll talk a little bit today about the application of the clinical model, just one clinical model that we developed um, at UCSF and, and we're always um, wanting to refine our thinking about that. But we'll, we'll talk a little bit about what we do essentially. Um, and, and so we'll break it up into intake, assessment, intervention, and maintenance. So at the intake, as Dr. Gehring had mentioned, patients really, um, it, it's tricky if a patient's on treatment um, that, and you'll hear later from Dieter as well, um, our, uh, our patient diet, that being on treatment often means uh, a number of doctor's visits and fatigue and um, just practically and logistically, it can be very challenging to engage in cognitive rehabilitation, a formalized cognitive rehabilitation. However, what we've found, and you'll hear more from Alexa later, that we often have found that patients do need some cognitive screening at a minimum and some um, cognitive education about how to manage those issues and issue spotting as they go into the inpatient phase and as they go into the immediate um, phase for a uh, while they're in treatment. How do they still manage their medications when they're in the immediate uh, in the immediate phase of um, radiation? How do they, you know, um, how do they manage going into the other room and not remembering while they're there? Um, how do they manage some of those uh, that deep fatigue that can come along with it? Um, so while a patient might not necessarily be engaging in um, psychotherapy or in uh, cognitive rehabilitation, they and if they're having some emotional distress, they can engage in other types of treatments, which we'll talk a little bit more about in, in a few moments. And psychiatric and medical stability, um, oftentimes we, we need to take a different approach, a uh, definitely uh, wanting to take those factors into account um, as we're wanting to you know, promote stability of those um, conditions um, as it relates and frees individuals up to focus on cognitive rehabilitation. And as Dr. Gehring had um, mentioned, that cognitive severity rather than pathology is, is something that we time and time find that mild to low moderate um, cognitive impairments often lend itself to a, a compensation and retraining approach, but more severe or more serious cognitive vulnerabilities really lend itself to uh, principles of environmental engineering and behavioral management, um, which have also been pretty crucial in, um, in the work that we do. So um, patients that we, we talked a little bit before about the motivational factors and cognitive changes um, that patients want to, um, that they want to learn strategies to adjust, address these issues. Um, you'll hear a little bit more um, from, uh, from our dyad where the clearer the goal, the better it is in the cognitive rehabilitation because patients can really have a clear definable goal to work towards. So this is the triage that we, we utilize. It's one way and um, that we found that's successful in bringing multiple disciplines in, but also um, right-sizing and personalizing the care that we provide to our patients. So they have cognitive or emotional complaints, sometimes the patients, sometimes it's caregivers, um, and sometimes they have disparate, um, uh, disparate concerns. And then that multi, we're, we're at this point, we're triaging from a multidisciplinary perspective. There's a cohort of our patients that we're, um, we're managing and uh, reviewing from a multidisciplinary perspective. And then really um, trying to make sure that we're considering, can they tolerate cognitive testing? Are they off the active treatment? And, um, and if so, then we, we consider a neuropsychological assessment and, and perhaps even cognitive rehabilitation. But if patients can't tolerate extensive to extended cognitive testing or really um, not medically stable, we still want to be able to provide some screening and also cognitive emotional education for them um, and to continue to work with our neuro-oncology colleagues to um, help support their capacity to manage those things um, and that sometimes patients don't need specialized intervention, um, but they could use some wayfinding in, in that process. So sometimes people ask me, what, what tests do you use, especially my neuropsychology? 
anthropology colleagues were always trying to learn from one another uh, about how to to manage these issues clinically and uh, some of the things that have come up today is uh, is something that I that I see in my practice where the individuals will have processing speed issues um, they'll have you know they'll, those network disruption um, challenges of executive functioning um, challenges, attention and concentration. So you'll notice this battery does um, provide a fair amount of um, looking at not only those areas, but providing um, where possible some alternative forms, because oftentimes what we're doing is serially testing these individuals over time. The additional um, components that I would, uh, I would add is, is that I'm always wanting to make sure that I'm integrating neuroanatomic correlates to the degree that um, possible as well as functional patient complaints evaluating those further. So I might add additional tests like the auditory constant trigrams or uh, or PASAT or other um, other concerns, especially if they have high level concerns related to going back to work that maybe a standard, um, some of these standard measures wouldn't necessarily um, provide. So doing um, that good clinical interview and, and making sure that we're um, both tracking along what the patient's quality of life goals are, what are their goals for cognition, um, as well as um, the functional analysis of the environment that they're going to return back to after they leave your, leave your office. Um, you'll hear a little bit more from Dieter about one of the ways that, that we've done that. It really is not a one size fits all. If there's one thing about cognitive rehab, there really is not a one size fits all in, um, in, in having a more, a more comprehensive neuropsychological assessment can really help in, in, that, um, in that journey. So our UCSF Neurocognitive Clinic, so we'll talk a little bit about that today. And um, one aspect of that clinic that I'll speak to is the cognitive rehabilitation. So if you notice, I didn't say anything yet about maintenance or intervention. So we're gonna talk a little bit more about intervention from a case-based perspective, so you can really kind of get a sense of how we're thinking through cases um, from a clinical-based um, formulation. But the maintenance part is also really crucial. So, you know, we started this talk talking about the chronic disease model approach. So we know that patients will have different needs at different points of the of the disease course. And we also need to be flexible to be able to um, make sure and meet the meet the needs of that patient at that uh, at, at their at that moment. So oftentimes there, there's a fair amount of surveillance that, um, that will happen. Even after I'm completed with active treatment with the patient, we'll, we'll still ask the neuro-oncologist to consider um, re-referral, having a low threshold for re-referral if, um, if they're continuing to have challenges. And, and I myself will, with some patients, will continue to um, do surveillance visits with them. So back to the neurocognitive clinic. So, uh, cognitive rehabilitation, again, is informed by neuropsychological assessment, um, and, it, and it, it also includes uh, uh, implemented in three processes, the acquisition, application, and adaptation phases. And so it, it would be remiss to say that cognitive cognitive rehabilitation only happens with neuropsychology. That is just so not true. Um, it really is a cognition, again, is a team sport. And maybe um, my uh, speech therapy colleagues and I are co-treating with a patient. They're doing a bottom-up sort of intervention, and I'm doing a top-down sort of intervention. And I, and I do believe, um, or my occupational therapy um, colleagues are, are doing um, interventions in, uh, in, in tandem or um, in sequence with me. So that, that's one of the things that we also kind of determine at, um, after the neuropsychological assessment and then go into treatment planning uh, about that. So time-limited sessions, um, we do time-limited sessions with booster sessions, and we're really focused on strength-based um, enhancing, uh, strength-based intervention, enhancing quality of life, cognitive education and support, and cognitive retraining. So this is a case that I had seen. Um, so Mark, he was diagnosed with a left frontal grade two astrocytoma. And at the time of diagnosis, he was working full-time in sales. And in 2017, he had a seizure and gradual progression that necessitated a course of radiotherapy and also chemotherapy. In the process of his returning to work, he noted word finding problems, fatigue, slow thinking, and distractibility. Imaging showed no change in tumor, but there was, two, there was T2 flare white matter changes. Um, and he was really worried about how this would negative impact his work. Um, and he had unfortunately, um, prior to starting with me, had gotten some um, 
negative feedback about his work performance and was placed on a performance improvement plan at work. So this was his cognitive testing prior to us starting our cognitive rehabilitation. So the gray range connotes cognitive performance in the normative range, and the red line is impaired range. And so his scores were adjusted for age and education, um, with lower scores equaling more impairment. So testing found that he had relative impairments, um, as you can see, in auditory attention, processing speed, and even his executive function was not quite in the normative range. It wasn't in the clinical deficit range, but it, um, it wasn't quite where it needs to be, especially given his role in sales. So once Mark and I sat down to review his results and treatment plan, he was relieved that maybe there were some things that we could um, work on to help him manage his cognitive slippage. So in the beginning of treatment, we really focused on helping him learn more about his cognitive strengths and vulnerabilities. He was highly fatigued and that was causing a lot more cognitive symptom flares and so really working on that helped a lot um, and to improve his problem solving. So um, he, he also during the application phase we did a we completed a job analysis and, and really figured out what were the essential tasks that he needed to do and then look at his neuropsychological test scores see where his strengths were and offset some of the liabilities that were coming up in his day to day. He also really um, benefited from um, tracking the way in which um, the practical strategies he was using um, improved his day-to-day -day function. So increasing his awareness about when things were going wrong earlier so he could pick those things up, that metacognitive skill, um, and also addressing word finding and, and slow thinking with, with pre-planning and pacing. So these interventions were uh, rehearsed during this in the sessions and then he would have after he would have homework afterwards um, that, that he would um, that he would I would guide him that he would develop. Um, so and then lastly, we adapted these strategies to less structured tasks in his life. So, for example, whenever he had to go meet a client um, wanting to make sure that he felt um, prepared to do that. And, and we did a lot of rehearsal and, and paced practice for that. So in my treat with Mark, we also focused on mastering principles of goal management training um, and, uh, and to help him improve his self-monitoring and awareness and, and reduce slips. We talk, uh, Dr. Gary talked a little bit about this intervention um, as it relates to, so Locke was one of the um, individuals who studied this um, and found benefit for this in the brain tumor population. Um, and also, you know, one of the major components of goal management training is increasing awareness, self-monitoring, and attentional control, that you can catch yourself making the slip earlier, you kind of pause and say, oh, hold on a second, am I on track or am I not on track? And then you change your approach so that way you're, you're regulating your goal-based behavior. Um, so multiple methods are important also. So someone can um, self-monitor, but then that doesn't necessarily mean that they'll know what to do when they get to that place of, oh, I caught myself, but now what do I do? So that problem solving, additionally, that they found uh, doing additional problem solving training is, is really important. So this is another interventional highlight that I used with Mark. Um, so forgetfulness and distractibility are some of the most common concerns that patients discuss, and, were really, and that was really common to Mark as well. So um, it, who, patients who experience this sense of distractibility will often feel overwhelmed with tasks. So there's a stacking of distractibility with anxiety, which can be very challenging for patients. So making sure that they are mastering relaxation strategies, breaking tasks into smaller pieces, and also um, making sure they're doing self-talk through a task to be able to optimize their attention and concentration. So for example, Mark learned that he, uh, with his slow thinking speed, he needed really to rely, for example, on notes before meetings, rehearsing per potential conversations that he might have to make it, um, to reduce the novelty and to, opt it, to reduce the executive functioning demands in that moment, and pre-plan to prepare for new, um, new client visits as we previously spoke about. Um, and further, similar to the work of Miyoto, we found our treatment that grouping information by category when taking notes for him was really, it was a really successful task management. For example, grouping the tasks he needed to do by urgency rather than, um, rather than just having a, a long list of things to do. So these were his post um, test scores after rehabilitation. So it was two months of treatment um, every other week for 30 to 45 minutes. 
um, using alternative forms. He had uh, post-testing found improvements in most domains with clinically significant improvements in auditory attention and concentration and uh, verbal learning and visual memory. His processing speed scores remained flat. They remained below the normative range, which required us to reinforce his need for using workarounds um, to um, reduce the slow thinking demands. So most, con mostly consisting of making more efforts to pre-plan, reducing his multitasking, and um, reducing demands in his work environment, such as um, workplace accommodations. So today, Mark's tumor remains stable. He's working 40 hours per week, and um, he's off his performance improvement plan. He hasn't returned back on it. He's continuing to rise up the ranks in his company, which I think that he's, he and his family are, are pleased about. So for him, that was his definition of um, his health-related quality of life and his quality of life goals. So I'll, uh, I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Bree, who is um, a neuropsychologist in our department who um, is, would like to speak with you a little bit more about our um, research that, that we've been developing as we understand this clinical kind of work. Excellent. Thank you, Dr. Wire-Jamora. Um, as Dr. Taylor mentioned earlier, Dr. Wire-Jamora now introduced me. I am Melissa Bree. I'm a neuropsychologist also working at the Brain Tumor Center. And as Drs. Wire Jamora and Gearing have mentioned previously, there is promising research and clinical observations to suggest that benefits of intervention for the management of cognition in the brain tumor population, that there is benefit worth pursuing. Um, that said, a solid understanding of the natural history of cognition, particularly in lower grade glioma or lower grade primary brain tumors, does remain a bit elusive. So there is insufficient data right now, at least, to support best practices for how and when to intervene over the arc of the disease course, as well as the durability of cognitive gains and the quality of life improvements that happen in these patients. So to this end, our UCSF Locleo Cognitive Research Group has committed time and resources to more systematically study these questions. Okay, next slide, please. So in our Locleo clinical trial, we've developed and launched a research protocol focused on the investigating that cognitive natural history, as I mentioned, of newly diagnosed lower grade glioma patients, as well as studying the feasibility, efficacy, as well as the durability of cognitive rehabilitative care. We're also examining correlates of related tumor characteristics and imaging parameters. Today, I'm excited to share more about the COG Rehab arm of the study specifically, lessons learned over the development of our neurocognitive clinic, as well as the future directions that we're hoping for for our clinical and research programs. Next slide, please. So in our Locleo study, participants undergo baseline assessment, including both cognitive testing and imaging. They're offered individual COG Rehab, primarily, or if they would like to, they could opt into being ra randomized into either a computer-based COG rehab program or a self-management education intervention. Um, so at that point, we then follow them for post-treatment testing and imaging, and then additionally, we follow up six months post-treatment. Next slide, please. Uh, in terms of our study interventions, the individual COG rehab option is a manualized executive functioning intervention that has been well established in other neurological diseases such as TBI and stroke. And as Dr. Wiregemore uh, went into a little bit more detail about that goal management training. Um, and this is delivered right now uh, via telehealth. Um, the second intervention is the Remind computer-based COG rehab program that Dr. Gearing spoke about in her presentation. And the uh, third intervention is daily text messages that gives participants education about how to manage their cognitive symptoms. And we actually look forward to sharing more about the preliminary findings from this study at our upcoming SNOW poster presentation. So keep an eye out for that as well. Next slide, please. So it's important to acknowledge that COG Rehab has not been broadly applied in surgical neuro-oncology. So in comparison with non-cancer neurological diseases, utilization remains pretty low, about 27.7%, and care is often fragmented. So one study found that only 9% of patients received language or cog rehab, much of which was in that first six months post-surgery, so long-term does not seem to be having as much follow-up as we would maybe appreciate from the studies we've been seeing. Um, further, despite the promise that cog rehab holds, there remains a number of barriers to access for the brain tumor population. 
also that lack of routine screening that's been mentioned that often means that milder cognitive changes can go undetected. Um, additionally, stigma, lack of awareness of the role that cog rehab plays, uncertainty about referral criteria, the small number of cog rehab service providers, and financial barriers, those are all challenges that our patients face when trying to access these services. Next slide, please. So it's important to acknowledge that patient-related factors should be taken into account when thinking about utilization of rehab and supportive services. A study by Longbecker and others noted uh, that reasons for underuse include these knowledge gaps regarding the treatability of symptoms, um, shifting standards for well-being, preference for self-management, uh, and cognitive impairments themselves playing a role in reduced identification. So systematic cognitive screening, addressing knowledge barriers and perceptions relating to help seeking, also providing tiers of care that can be complementary to cognitive self-management values and problem-solving access issues through advocacy can, may, can and will hopefully assist in improving patient physical, psychological, and social well-being. Next slide, please. So in the last few very exciting years, uh, we've learned much from our colleagues, uh, the patients that we serve, as well as their caregivers, both about the challenges that they experience, but also how to better meet their cognitive care needs. Um, so not only does cognition require this multidisciplinary or interdisciplinary lens, but we've also learned that caregivers and patients may have similar but differing needs, differing supports that they might need. So therefore providing levels of care and a flexibility to sort of pace along with individuals as those needs change throughout the disease course, that that's really crucial. Um, another lesson learned is that clear and practical cognitive goals framed from a strengths-based perspective can not only support patient resilience, but can also really promote engagement and care. Next slide, please. So looking forward now toward the future, we want to learn from other cognitive mechanistic as well as cognitive care models. And given resource scarcity on a more local level, we're hoping to expand our services to include more robust interdisciplinary collaborations, diverse population engagement, and cog rehab groups, including telehealth options. Additionally, um, you'll hear much more from Naomi, Alexa, and Margareta in the next presentation about our continued programmatic expansion efforts. Next slide, please. I just want to acknowledge, too, that this effort would not be possible without the generous support of Sherry Sobrato Bryson, brain cancer survivor, and Locleo teams and uh, funders. So thank you to them, and also thank you all for your attention, and we look forward to talking with you more about our work. Thanks so much. Next slide. There you go. <laughs> thank you. Um, thank you, Melissa and, and Chris. So we have time for a few questions. Um, one question that had come up was, um, I, you know, our, our research and certainly most of your clinical experiences have been with lower grade glioma patients. And I was wondering, uh, one of the questions is from uh, glioblastoma patients and whether you feel they also could benefit from cognitive rehab and possibly consideration for the timing of that intervention. Yeah, so um, I, I would say from my clinical experience, yes, that individuals with glioblastoma can benefit from cognitive rehabilitation. Um, it is a, it's often um, we're engaging in that intervention after they've completed active treatment. They may be on adjuvant um, chemotherapy, but, um, and then also that their goals might change over the course in a different trajectory and making sure that we're pacing along with that. So there's more refining of the treatment planning goals um, and, and, we're, and definitely attention to that and also engaging the caregiver as well. We didn't really talk much about that in, um, in the talk, but that is a really crucial piece that, that we found that these, um, these cognitive challenges really live within the context of the dyad and making sure that we're addressing um, both, both aspects of, uh, of this disease from a supportive care perspective. Thank you. Yeah, I, I think personally, I've also had patients clinically benefit with glioblastoma and, and other high-grade tumors from, from cognitive rehab with disease stability, so I would echo that as well. Um, and then as far as um, the balance of individualizing testing and assessments 
and how to generalize that to effective therapies, for example, pharmacologic and non-pharmacologic. How do you see that piece of things that you, each patient has sort of some individual cognitive strengths and weaknesses and vulnerabilities, but how do you rectify that with, with needing to assess large scale um, you know, cognitive improvement with intervention? I think that is a that is a huge challenge that um, that I know in our global trial that trial that was part of many of our um, beginning conversations. How can we take this very personalized, you know, rehabilitation approach and and uh, high touch assessment approach and begin to transport that in a way that um, that is meaningful across broader samples, but also broader um, broader ways in which patients can access assessment and care. So, you know, I don't have, um, I think it's something that we're working on as a field of neuropsychology, how to transport these um, aspects of, of um, our assessment to broader bases. I would say that we, um, we do in our um, neuropsychological practice, we use standardized measures that um, can cross cut can cross cut over, you know, broad um, cognitive domains and and I think that um, being able to make sure that we're making those measures to be both uh, utilizable in a, from a research perspective but also from a clinical perspective is, is really important so um, so I, I think that there is no um, there's no replacement for neuropsychological assessment especially as it relates to informing treatment but I'm, I'm hoping in um, in the coming years we'll, we'll get it right in, in terms of being able to provide something that can be robust but transportable.